Vox and Hops Brutal North America is brought to you by Indie Merch Store. I would take someone who is a decent musician who I get along with great over the best musician you could find who I can't stand. Because it's, it's, you realize that it's, it's way more important. You're way happier. Things are just better. Especially if you're touring and you live with them on a bus. Like that's that's most of the time. You're only on stage for maybe an hour or whatever. So it's, it's the rest of the time you have to deal with the, you know these people. So if you can get into... So any young people out there, forget about the star guitar player or singer. They got to be good, but take the person you get along with first. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media. I hope you had a glorious weekend. I most certainly did. I am so damn excited for Vox and Hops Brutal North America, which is coming up throughout the week of June 21st to the 25th. There are 22 collaborative brews that are dropping on the market all across the United States and Canada. I have teamed up 22 Vox and Hops alumni with metal breweries to create unique brews for their bands. I am so damn excited for this. I can't wait for you to all see and taste and experience these collabs. It is truly amazing. For more information on Vox and Hops Brutal North America, head on over to my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And there's a whole bunch of stuff there. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal is Montreal's premier metal promoter. They put on a bunch of sick shows throughout the year but more than that they also put on one of north america's best metal festivals and that is the absolute truth they have just started announcing new shows coming through montreal in the fall they got ginger with suicide silence you got all them witches they have announced that bloodbath will be coming through montreal in spring of 2022 and they have just announced that ramstein has been rescheduled for august 2022 i am so damn excited about that I'm so stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I'm also asking you to rate it and write a review, because when you do that, more metalheads just like yourself will be able to discover the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, why do I say this? It's because when someone is looking for a new podcast to invest their time in, what do they do? They scroll down and they read those reviews. If the reviews are favorable and reflect stuff that they love and like, they will most probably give that podcast a chance. So by you writing a review, you could be the person that sways someone to become a brand new Vox and Hops head. And that would be something that I would truly, truly appreciate. Now, in today's episode, I'm with Wayne Lozanek of Hate Breed. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 270. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today I'm with Wayne Lozanek of Hate Breed. I am very, very stoked to be with you, Wayne. Uh, let's start with a very simple question of how are you doing? I'm doing okay, besides the pandemic and everything being shut down. Everything else is, everything else is good. So far, so good. It's all we can do is just be positive and keep, uh, you know, and that's a big part of hate breed. So, so <laughs> exactly. Yes. It, 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 was it hard? Was there a moment where, where, you know, you guys are a band that spreads positivity. You guys are in, world renowned for that. Do you guys even hit dark days sometimes where you oh, need to go yeah. back and, and listen to your own yeah. catalog? <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of those days, let me tell you, but we, you know, we try and do the best we can overall. It, it's pretty good, but everyone, everyone has their ups and downs. Absolutely, absolutely. Which is where I'm going next, the dark question, and then we'll just have fun. How did you exactly did you cope with this glorious year that is now behind us of 2020? Well, uh, we had we actually just finished the record before everything happened. So it was like all set. The record was done. We had a tour booked. We were leaving. It was like we were supposed to leave the end of March to do this Mm. world tour with Parkway Drive and everything just came to a halt. So there's, there's been nothing much going on since we already did all the music. It was like we spent so much time in the studio and everything. But we did come out with our own beer, which is right here. Breed Brew. Very tasty. I love that. <laughs> so that's, that's about all 
the band collectively did, you know, it was, you know, with no music going on. So it was something, something good. Kind of Which is crazy it. for you guys. Cause you guys are a very, very busy band. Oh yeah. Like this is the most I haven't toured since I started. It's, it's insane. Completely crazy. Uh, let's talk about breed brew. Obviously I saw this happen. I was super stoked before we go there though. I want to hear about your very first beer. Do you remember the first beer you drank Wayne? Uh, the first beer I drank, I mean, obviously there were like little sips here and there when you're a little kid, like someone give you, but I do remember the first time I actually got drunk off mm. of beer and it was a six pack of Budweiser. Whoa. And <laughs> the, whole was, the whole six pack, the whole six pack. I finished it all. I, we each got like me and a couple of my friends got three, six packs each. And it, I drank it, got drunk and I was puking the whole next day. So that's, that's my first experience with, uh, getting drunk off of Bud, a six pack of Budweiser and feeling my first hangover ever. Take me to, take me to uh, that first craft beer, something that opened your eyes. Uh, that beer could be more than Budweiser. Well, actually the, I don't, I'm not too much of a craft beer guy. I have to say, I'm still, I'm kind of a Coors Light guy. I'm more of a, you know, quantity over quality, I guess. Cause when I, you know, when we, I go out with my friends, we drink a lot. So it's, it's a lot easier to drink the Coors Lights and stuff like that. But the Breed Brew, I will say, is definitely a step above Coors Light. <laughs> and it's still, it's not, it's not an IPA, but it's like a lager kind of pilsner. And it has just like, just enough to where it has way more of a full bodied flavor, I guess you would, you could say, but you could still, you could still drink a lot and not feel like you're weighed down. Let's talk about this breed brew. How did this come together? Uh, how exactly did, did Hate Breed end up putting out a beer this year? Uh, I believe it was our bass player, Chris Beatty. There is a uh, there's a brewery up in Southington, Connecticut, up near where he lives, called Witch Doctor Brewing Company. And he somehow got together with them. And I think they're like, you know, metal fans, hardcore fans, people. And then and he said, you know, there's there's nothing going on. You guys are kind of slow. We're not doing anything. So what do you think about doing, you know, a collaboration with you guys? And they were into it and it all worked out. And from there, we had someone do, do the artwork, which as you can see, looks, looks pretty good. I it's think. super cool. It's, it's, it's so you guys, it's, it's uh, live for this lager, you know, little song lyrics in there. Your brew awaits you, you know, little <laughs> subtle hints. And, uh, having done that we were actually able to do a few socially distanced events at the brewery so it was kind of like a meet and greet slash beer tasting kind of thing which it was like the closest thing of having a show like all fans together they were super happy about it because they haven't gone anywhere the whole year either so so that was that was cool and it's it just just it just it's been working so far it's available either at the brewery some local um Stores are carrying it, but you could also order it online from Halftime Beverage. Very cool. If you and they don't, I guess they, they don't ship to all states. There's certain laws where they yeah, can't it's crazy. or something. But check out, see if your state is uh, available on there. You could order some up, and it's good. Even if you don't yeah. like beer, it's cool just to have the souvenir as a you know the can artwork. It's happening so much. Uh, me being involved, you know, Cryptopsy, we have. A craft beer. Uh, Voivod up here in Montreal has a craft beer. A bunch of us are doing it. I love it. It's like an extension of the band. It's a way to, uh, you know, dig deeper into the creativity, the creative process of creating an album versus creating a beer. Uh, I am also going to be drinking a Connecticut beer. This is from Lasting Brass. This okay. is their Squirrel Masters. It is their peanut butter chocolate porter. I uh, Wow. Uh-huh really really enjoy this style of brew and it honestly hasn't taken off up here in montreal at all so so do you I'm know excited. where in it where in connecticut that's actually yeah from? yeah it's from oakville oakville okay that's yeah that's that's up by uh, kind of in the same area of uh the witch doctor similar similar take me through the whole process you guys saw you guys were there on canning day was this the first time that you oh went? yeah to to a, a brew house uh, your your first real experience of how beer has been made was this the first time oh yeah definitely it was it was cool because 
they came just, it was like pallets and pallets of uh, these empty cans with no tops on them. So we're just, you know, it was like an, just the assembly line. We just put all the cans there. I have it on video somewhere. I think it might be on my Instagram if you search. And uh, it just, you know, they put the beer in, the tops get put on. We wipe them down and it just, it was it actually took like a couple hours of that, like nonstop. Mm-hmm. But that was definitely cool to see, be a part of it. Oh, you got you got to do it right. If not, the beer gets all fucked up. It gets all oxidized. Uh, right. Cheers, Wayne. Cheers. Afternoon beers. I love it. Ooh, I smell the peanut butter. Yeah, I don't usually drink this early. I just woke up like a little while ago, but <laughs> it's just for a special occasion, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. I greatly <laughs> appreciate it. This is phenomenal. Um, 7.5 ABV, I believe. No, 6, 6% ABV. Um, creamy, chocolatey, the peanut butter kicks on the nose. I love it. I love it. I love it. I do like I, peanut butter. Maybe I'll have to uh, check that one cool. out. It's very, very cool. What is the ABV on a uh, breed brew? It's only 4.5%. Perfect. But it's that's why I said you could drink a lot of them. Just highly crushable. And when, when you guys were putting together this recipe, uh, how much involvement did you have? What was it like an, an inner argument? Like, no, we want to make an IPA because everyone makes IPAs. Or did you guys easily decide upon this easy crushable? You can have a bunch of them. Yeah, I think that was more of the thing because we all like some of the guys like Matt Byrne, he'll drink some IPAs every once in a while. Beatty sometimes. Frank's pretty much Budweiser kind of guy. Jamie doesn't drink at all. So he's yes. the only one in the bank. He doesn't even drink. So, so we, I think we wanted to just have something that was kind of would be more palatable for more people, which we might actually come out with some type of IPA later on. We're, we're thinking, talking about doing a non-alcoholic one. So this was just the first to kind of experiment to do something that a lot of people would like. And I've actually heard from people that do drink IPAs that they like this one too. So it's, it's kind of like a good, good combination. Well, it's definitely, you guys are on trend because a lot of these heavy IPA drinkers are into it because of the hazy craze. And those are just sweet, sweet, heavy beers, high ABV. So you have two, three of them and you're done. Whereas yeah, that's why these like... ones are crushable. You can have three, four of them. And, you know, as a, it's like listening to music, you know, the, the older you get, the more you, are of a metal head you want to go back and hear the the simplest the simplest right. and the the refined tastes of metal so you go backwards and that's where you know loggers are really taking off right now so you guys especially are right if you're out somewhere like if you're at a show or something oh, and yeah. you're just you're not even thinking you're just drinking watching the band having a good time so you don't want to be all full and bloated by the end of the night. <laughs> no, you don't. No. And I, I am do think it's very interesting what you guys are doing as well because you guys made an Instagram page for breed brew which is yes led me to think is this a collab or is this like a whole new brand like a relationship that you've made which with, with witch doctor brewing where you guys are creating a new brand that is breed brew that is going to have ipas that's going to have uh, the the lager the the live for this lager a non-alcoholic brew for you know like i'm just i'm curious about that right that, that's what we're that's what we're hoping like Very i said cool. if the people want it and there's a a demand for it i guess we'll keep doing it, which it helps everyone out. It helps us out, especially now because nothing is going on and the brewery, it helps them out to get stuff going. And then the fans just, it's something for them, something, you know, new and different. So, I think it's, so awesome. we're hoping on it. I think it's awesome. And, you know, uh, brew dog did a great job with their ghost Walker IPA. It's probably one of the best non-alcoholic beers that I've ever had. Uh, when I, you know, I had Randy on to talk about that. And right. when I spoke to ja- to Jamie on the podcast, he was he hinted at that this was coming. So so a non alcoholic beer that he can enjoy would be something really cool too. Right, because there's a bunch of people out there that love craft beer, but they also like that option of not having alcohol. So. Exactly. Very exciting. I love it. Uh, this is going to be, or this is a Heavy Montreal Presents of Ox and Hops episode. Let's talk about Montreal. Do you have any vivid memories of your first time playing Montreal? A special memory of Montreal that you'd like to share with the Montreal folks that are listening? Ooh, first, I, it's always great there. I could tell you that. Playing every time we play there, it's on any tour we've done, the, the shows are packed and the crowd is really into it. Heavy Montreal is like, is a great festival and I wish they had more like that in the U S mm-hmm. it seems like they're, they're, they're starting to do here and there in the U S but that's, uh, that's definitely good. And then, uh, I don't know, there's just so it's just, I can't think of any one specific memory. 
that's popping up, but just every, every time we go there is a great time. There's a bar, there's uh Fafoons. Have you been there? To the, of course. Yeah. That's, that's always a good time. There's, there's some stories I don't think I could tell because <laughs> I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but that that's uh, something that sticks out. We were there on tour with like sworn enemy and, and all this stuff. And we had a good time, but uh, We'll just we'll just leave it at that. Actually, we're there. I think Five Finger Death Punch too on that tour. We rolled through there. That's like a fun like because we don't have many metal like rock bars like that in mm-hmm. Connecticut. Or there's I don't think there's any unless you put the unless there's a band playing or you put money in the jukebox and you try and make it one. But that's like go to a, like a metal bar like specifically where it's like you know it's tons of metal heads you know hanging out. It's just it's like a cool scene. It's that's that's always great going you know going to places like that. Absolutely. For fun is a classic. It's the CBGBs of Montreal. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's Great right time. next to a bunch of venues, you know, Metropolis is right next door. And that, yeah. We've played and there. Yep. That's, that's Club probably where Soda. Club Soda yep. is another one right down the yep. street. So, so it's, it's prime stomping ground for any bands coming in. And especially if it's Metropolis, I'm telling us now the buses park right behind it. So yep. you can just crawl right back. Exactly. <laughs> I, I've definitely done that. <laughs> I want to hear about the, the soundtrack of your youth. When you were growing up in your parents' or guardians' house, what music was playing when you were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents or guardians listen to? Well, actually, funny enough, my father is the one who pretty much sent me on this journey of getting into heavy metal, if you will, because Kiss, he had Kiss yeah. albums, and that was it. I saw, you know, saw the makeup and the fire and the blood, and I started listening to that. So that's what got me into this music, you know, all to get, you know, together. But like my father would listen to, he listens to stuff like, you know, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, David Bowie, uh, you know, typical like rock cream, stuff like that. And then my mother would be listening to like Donna Summer, Diana Ross, and like, you know, more, um, you know, more stuff like that. So it was kind of a combination of that type of music as in, in my early childhood I love that. And and honestly, I, I interviewed a bunch of people. Barbara Streisand, she looks yeah. like her. <laughs> uh, Kiss and the Beatles are always the top answers. Yeah. If I, if yeah. I were to like put them all in like a, a graph somewhere, those would come up at the top easily, easily. What was your first love? What was the band that became your first band that wasn't influenced by someone else? I well, once after Kiss, I just started listening to like I was into metal like as like a young kid. Like I remember when I was in second grade, like listening to Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Ozzy, and just all that stuff. I, I just loved right, and then like Def Leppard, and then a little later on Motley Crue. So it was just I just loved it all. There wasn't I could I don't think there was really one I could pick, but it was just all that because back in the day, you know, MTV would play these bands. So as a little kid, you'd see like whatever men at work and the police and all that. But then you'd see like Iron Maiden or Judas Priest. And it was like these, you know, crazy metal guys that just that just always appealed to me as a even a little kid. They, they were gods and, and they were they were, you know, it wasn't like you had to wait up to watch it. It was interspliced yeah. throughout the day. Exactly. Big difference. Completely to, different. To what I grew up with, with Headbangers Ball. You had to wait for that. Show. Yeah, right. Yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. Let's talk about your first show. Do you remember the first show that you went to go see? My first show was right before my 10th birthday, and it was Kiss on the Lick It Up tour and Accept Balls to the Wall album. They opened up. That was my first my first concert. It was New Haven Coliseum. And then literally like two or three weeks later at the same place. I saw Judas Priest on Defenders of the Faith tour with Great White opening up, who I didn't even know who they were. I think they were on their first album. So those two I saw within in the same month of my 10th birthday. Cool parents, Wayne. Yes. <laughs> that, was, that was cool. How about your first time on stage? My first time? Uh, well, I guess we're going to have to go back to uh, high school. When I was 14, I was in a cover band. Mm. And we played, it was like the high school, it was called Spring Weekend. And we were freshmen and there were like other bands. The older kids like went on after us. So we had to go on at 11 a.m. in the morning. (laughs) But we played, we were like the heaviest band on there because we were doing like, we did Metallica, Black Sabbath, 
I think we did we did Rush, Ozzy, uh, and then stuff like that. And then you know the other bands were did I don't even know one of them did like Billy Joel and but they did some some metal stuff. But but that was my first time, and we got there were people there to see us. It's the first time I heard people cheering. Mm. It was definitely nervous because I was actually singing at the time too. So I was singing and playing guitar. We were a three piece. The band was called Minotaur, <laughs> and this this was. Actually, I think I might have just turned 15 and they were 14. This was like 1989 at wow. freshman year of high school. So that was my first time ever on stage. How about that that KISS show right before your 10th birthday? Was it like, a, I'm going to be on stage eventually? Did you have the bug then? I mean, just I was a pure fan. I was, I was hoping, like, my, that was another thing. My father used to kind of play guitar, so he had one around. So I would kind of just bang on it and just make a lot of noise. So I've always been interested in playing the guitar and, and the whole, you know, metal music scene always appealed to me. So I, I think, yeah, I was hoping someday that would be me. Did you did you sing out of necessity? A lot of people I've been speaking to that weren't singers or ended up being singers sang because they had to because they had no other other people to find. Uh, no, I actually I was when I was 12. That's when I discovered Metallica and like. James Hetfield was like one of my biggest influences. I thought he was like the greatest, coolest thing ever back. That was when Master of Puppets came out. So I kind of emulated myself, kind of left with James Hetfield, I guess. So playing guitar, but I also played solos. So like, you know, my two is like biggest influences are like James Hetfield and Kirk Hammett. So the combination of them and like Randy Rhodes, I loved a lot too. So I wanted to sing back then, but then later on, it was just like, eh, I'd rather just play guitar and plus i was in a cover band we had like a couple originals but they weren't anything great and like my first high school band being from montreal it's it's super easy or was easy to find like-minded musicians to start bands was it like that in connecticut back in the day there was there was a few it wasn't like a ton of people like i'm talking my early early high school because we were so young but then like I joined Hatebreed at the beginning first, like I left, came back up that whole thing. So, but at that time in the hardcore, there were tons of musicians. Like, like we would go to hardcore shows every weekend and there would be like almost everyone in there was in a band. So there was, there was tons of musicians. That's the mid, you know, early mid nineties, which in that, that style and, and that like camaraderie of the, of the musicians, there was, there was tons, but in high school, it was, there was a few here and there. But I have like my two, actually two solid friends that are still my best friends to this day that I played with uh, in high school. So it was just us three, three piece. We never, we always thought about trying to get another singer, but no one really worked out or even another guitar player. But it was just, it just worked, you know, with your friends. That's the best thing. If you get into a band with your friends, uh -huh. it just, that just makes everything better. So you're still friends with the, the guys from Minotaur. Yes. That's so cool. <laughs> and they're identical so cool. twins, too. Oh, wow. Wild. <laughs> yeah. And it's important. And that's it's a very good lesson for anything. It's, you know, as we get older, we, we quickly learn as we're in a band that we have to be friends to make this work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would take someone who's a decent musician who I get along with great over the best musician you could find who I can't stand. Because <laughs> so it's you realize that it's it's way more important. You're way happier. Things are just better, especially if you're touring and you live with them on a bus. Oh yeah, like that's that's most of the time. You're only on stage for maybe an hour or whatever. So it's, it's the rest of the time you have to deal with the, you know these people. So if you can get into so any young people out there, forget about the star guitar player or singer. They got to be good, but take the person you get along with. Good first. humans first. Good humans yeah. first. Because you got to live with that. You got to live with that good human for 23 hours. And then, exactly. you enjoy, and then you can enjoy the excellent musician for that one hour. So you exactly. Gotta balance. Right. Because <laughs> then you're going to end up either quitting or getting kicked out anyway. So or you have to start from the beginning again. <laughs> <laughs> what would have been the last show that you went to go see or play? I don't know if you guys, I wasn't sure well, we on the road. Before we, the pandemic. we didn't play. Our last show we played was like October 2019. And that okay. was a Dropkick Murphy's Clutch Tour. Because right after that, we went into the studio and started yeah, yeah. recording. So we were we were in the studio. We didn't even have any played since then. But the last show I went to was 
Jeff Tate doing the, it was, uh, he did the full Empire album and full Rage for Order album, I think. It was in this place in Fairfields, Connecticut, this little like theater hall. So that was, that was the last show. That was like February of 2020, I think. And then that was it. (laughs) The biggest rest that our ears have had, Wayne. Yeah. (laughs) Our ears are just happy. (laughs) Uh, I would like to talk about uh, your iconic riffs. I I had Michael Lamott on. I asked him the same question. Uh, I believe that you are in the same field as this. Uh, In a different world, same field. You know, Amit has killer, killer melodic riffs that are just album after album. I asked him, where does he come up with these? You know, where does he find the inspiration? Same thing for you. I was listening to that today to Weight of the False Self and that title track, that riff, it's simple. It's c- caveman music, as right. Jester would say, but but it's so damn catchy. Actually, uh, believe it or not, Jamie and BD write most of the music for the band. Like Killer. we'll get like they'll like we all have ideas, but they're have the main like riffs. So then we'll get in the studio like now th- it's not like the old days where we jam in the basement yeah. or whatever. So now we just go into the studio. They have their ideas. Jamie will like grab a guitar and he'll like kind of show me his ideas. And then I'll, you know, try and like put him into a thing where like, you know, be like, so you want to go like this or sometimes we'll even hum stuff yeah, like that, like his ideas. And then we'll play and then BD has a lot. And then we, we get together and we like put them all, together in the in the studio and then so they're actually they've always been like the main songwriters which is people you know and jamie writes all the lyrics too Mm -hmm. so they're they're the main thing like i i wrote i wrote all the solos the guitar solos and i wrote the uh on this last album i wrote the intro and the main riff to the herd will scatter which if you listen to it's it's a little more metal Mm -hmm. but it's like but mostly they're they're mostly it's their like their bass riffs and then we put them together it's a beautiful like, while we're beautiful sitting, sitting around just yeah so that's beautiful that's, system that's the, that was that that's the formula like together. i said we it's it works now so it's like we don't want to change the no, formula no, no. and we record it as we're going so we could try different things try different drum beats slow it down speed it up so this way this is all during pre-production and zeus who records yes. the album he has a big hand in it too he'll tell us like eh, don't do that maybe you should try this instead and maybe put this part like that. So it's all, it's a big collaboration of us putting the songs together, but it's, it's mostly actually BD and Jamie's uh, riffs from the bass. The iconic riffs. I love it. Yes. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's talk about this new record, The Weight of the False Self. It dropped November 27th via Nuclear Blast. You guys pushed it back, right? It was supposed to come out during the summer. It was supposed to come out in May, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So talk me through uh, your mindset. I asked Jamie the same question, so I'm curious if you're on the same page um, about holding on to the record, what that felt like, and then finally releasing it. Well, yeah, it was. We were all like super excited when we were finished because I, I think this is like this album came out great. Like the guitar tone that me and Zeus came up with in the studio would it's bigger, it's it's heavier, and just the songs. I think. Like we were just so excited to get out, even like the solos, like there's a song cling to life where, mm-hmm. you know, we're not really known for our solos, but you know, Jamie will be like, all right, in this song, I want to solo from here to here. So, you know, I'll sat down with Zeus and like, I try to do different things. And he's like, Oh no, keep going. It's more, I'm like more, it's longer. I'm like, wow, I get to play this long. solo." <laughs> so that was like cool and different. And then we were all set to go on this huge tour with Parkway drive. Like we were going to go to Europe. Enormous. Yeah. Europe. Then we were going to come back, do a, a small U.S. run headline. We we're going to go to Australia after that, back to Europe for the festivals, and then a, a full U.S. tour in the fall. And then everything just came to a halt. So it was like we, the, even the record label, I think, kind of shut down. They were only mm-hmm. put out a couple of things. So, so we, I don't even, we couldn't even put it out anyway. So it was definitely because you can't tour on it. So it's, you got to promote it somehow. Luckily, we did have a song come out on Valentine's Day. It was just a standalone single called When the Blade Drops. Yeah. And it's like streaming only, which I think I thought was kind of weird. It's not even on the album. But I guess this is a new thing that these streaming services do to try and get something. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know Creating why. The hype. I actually feel that, actually, because I hate listening to a single before an album comes out. I feel like yeah. it kills the, the momentum of the album because I'll skip it. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, you get sick of it. That's true. That's, that's good. I never thought of that actually. But but that was so that was cool, and that one had a solo in it too, which I was happy. <laughs> I thought that that was a good song, but uh, but it would be cool to even just have some kind of single, like even like vinyl with that song on it, and maybe some live tracks or something. But it's it's literally like if you don't stream music, you don't hear it. Which you know, is weird. A lot to of me. our fans, Cryptopsy fans, Hapy fans, the older generation might not yeah. be into streaming. Right. Yet. But at least we had something come out with the sound and you know something to look forward to. And then, yeah, it was shut down. It was, it was definitely a big disappointment, but I, I was happy we actually got it out in November, even though we couldn't do much promotion for it, but you know, what are you going to do? It's at least the fans had something to kind of give them during they the pandemic, it, especially yeah. the positive messages that you guys right. push it. It's needed during this pandemic. So, so. I and this was written great. before the pandemic. So people are always like, oh, he must have had some influence. So I was like, no, this was maybe he's like a psychic. And he was like, you know, <laughs> saying it was going to predicting it was going to happen. Hey, Jamie knows what's going on. There, there would be yeah. no Vox and Hops if it wasn't for the Jazz to show. So there you I, go. I, avid fan. I told him I presented him with a sandwich when when I had my interview with him because I owed him a sandwich for, for inspiring me <laughs> yeah. to That's starting great. a podcast, a metal podcast. I added the beer, but. The metal podcast was his idea. Nice. <laughs> Speaking about when Jamie's doing podcasts, uh, I know my band would get rather irritated with me if I would commandeer the bandwagon or a backstage space when I'm conducting interviews, when I'm on the road. How does that go down when Jamie's on the road with you guys? Uh, he, he does sometimes commandeer the back lounge of the bus, which, you know, whatever. He'll, he'll, he'll do it on there and sometimes in the dressing room but i try and stay once we're if we're not driving i try and stay off the bus uh, anyway as much as possible i mean sometimes you just go in your bunk you put your ear yep. pods in you don't hear anything going on anyway so it's not really it's not really a problem but yeah he definitely takes over some some spots here and there but yeah whatever N not not a big problem <laughs> let's talk about um a live stream is that something that interests hate breed is that something that interests you i feel like it needs to be special if we're going to do it which is why cryptopsy's never done anything like that yeah i uh i've thought of like i would do it if, if the band was in agreement to do it but for us it's more about like the live show is not the same if you're just sitting on your couch and there's no audience like the audience is a big part of our show especially yes. they want to mosh they want to jump all over each other they want to yes, sing you know get the aggression out we're not the type we're not like dream theater where you could sit and be like, wow, that's really cool time signatures. And those arpeggios are really tasteful. And, you know, just, we're not, we're just, we're more of an energy physical type band. It's like a lot of people even said, someone just said this, like made a comment or whatever the other day, they're like, I listened to hate breed and I'm like, eh, it's okay. And then I saw the live show and then I really, I understood it. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, you need to, you need the whole experience to really get what we're about. Especially coming energy. from the hardcore scene, it's it's not you know it's yeah it's about the energy and everything else. It's not really about how many scales you can fit into a song. We played a festival d'été au Québec, de Québec, sorry, uh, together a few years back, and man, were they crazy that night! I was <laughs> I was manning the merch table, helping out for a moment, and the crowd was just insane. Yeah, you guys, it was so much fun. <laughs> That's another good thing about us we can play these festivals we could play with like hardcore bands one mm -hmm. day death metal bands another day and then you know radio rock metal bands whatever and we somehow we fit in with all of them and we get people to like us so that that's a that's a big plus of being in this band which like i said if you don't see the live show you won't understand because if you just listen to you like how are they playing with them but it's just it just works and that's that's a great great part of being in this band you put the work in, you guys toured with so many people, so many markets, yeah, so many different bands, just, you know, getting the name out there and perfecting the live show and the energy that that's just years of experience. So, so you guys put the work in, so you deserve everything that's happening. Uh, let's talk about a plan B, obviously plan A worked, you becoming an internationally renowned known musician. If that didn't work out, if the guitar, if Minotaur, you know, <laughs> didn't start and, and you never really got that bug and we're hanging out with those twins and you ended up doing something else. What else would you be doing if you weren't a musician? Well, let's see, right before, well, I was a guitar tech before I came back as the 
playing in the band. I, I mm-hmm. teched for Hatebreed actually first, and then I teched for a few other bands there and there before Sean quit. And they're like, Sean might be quitting. You want to come back? I'm like, yeah, you know, sure. I'm already here. I know most of the songs <laughs> anyway. It, it's, it kind of this smooth right, right in. That was 2009. But before that, I owned one of those coffee lunch trucks. I don't know if they have really? them in Canada. They, they go to like the job sites with the silver yeah, yeah. doors. No you sit way. there, the construction workers, you sell them coffee and egg sandwiches and all that. So I did that for like eight years. I was up at four o'clock in the morning every day and just, just grinding that every, and it was, it was pretty good. It's cause it's like your own, you're your own boss and you don't have to deal. You just got to deal with angry customers. If you like run on a hot dogs or <laughs> meatballs or something by the time you get there. But that's, I didn't really have, much of a a huge career other than music and that so i don't i don't know what i'd be doing right now crazy did you i know myself when i go to shows if i'm there to do interviews or stuff like that when i could go to shows and i see my friends on stage i'm like god i want to be on stage that must be oh, tough yeah. being, being a crew member i always feel bad uh, i don't feel bad for crew members yeah no i well, because this is the thing, since I was in the band at the beginning, but it was so different then. We were playing, mm-hmm. you know, skate parks and teen centers and people's basements. And it was totally, I never would have thought the band at, was going to blow up to what it was. Like, if you go back and watch those videos and you listen to like Under the Knife, which that, I played on that one, that was the EP. Like, no way I would have thought this music was going to be huge and it was mm-hmm. going to be a career. So it wasn't like, I definitely enjoy playing, but just to be out and in, in working in within the music field, like plugging in amps and changing strings. I just enjoy being around it. So even just touring, being behind the scenes was still enjoyable, more enjoyable than selling some angry construction worker or an egg and cheese sandwich that he's going to complain about the price or something. So it, it wasn't, it didn't like bother me at all. I was, I was just happy to be out there, especially to, I never left the East coast until I started touring. And then I got to see the whole world and get paid for it and party with all these bands that I used to look up to. Like I met all Exodus and all, you know, all these bands I ended up teching for Exodus actually on a tour monster magnet. So it was, it was cool. I see that. That that totally makes sense to be out there to, to, you know, it's a completely different thing. Yeah. And and then you got to step out onto stage. Do you remember that first show when you, when you, you know, being back, but at that higher level. Yeah, the well, the first show was a really small kind of like surprise show, kind of like a warm up thing. It was in Massachusetts, this little little club called Fat Cat, and it was cool. I was, you know, it was packed, people going nuts. Little tiny club. We set up our own stuff. It wasn't like we had this big crew or anything. And then, but and then we did a couple of shows here and there. But then the first show of my first tour was download fest england yeah. in front of yeah. eighty thousand people so that's <laughs> all right you're doing your first tour here you go and it was just like and then my amp wasn't working i had my tech was like trying to fix something was wrong i'm like behind the amp going i don't know he's like it's nothing's coming out and that guy's yelling at me the stage manager but it was like one button was pressed in that shouldn't have been luckily we did it but then but i think being a tech for bands i was kind of almost used to being out there even just checking the gear mm-hmm. like in front of the big crowd so mm-hmm. it wasn't like so much of a shock because i would already ever been doing that for a couple of years so i think it, it was almost natural i just kind of just went right in and it just worked it's so much fun it's, I'm, it's so awesome so awesome how it all happened for you um let's wrap this up with a classic box and hops wrap-up question uh it probably never happens to you because uh you know you don't start drinking at 2 p.m normally but every once in a while it happens to everyone what is your hangover cure Lots of water. That's that's it. Water and rest. Like I usually, if I'm too hungover, I barely get off the couch. So it's couch and water. That, that's that. really, really all I could do. And it's waited out. <laughs> Wayne, thank you so, so much. For taking the time to hang out with me and talking about your life, music and craft beer. I want to give a shout out to uh, Jim and Corey from Crush, Kill, Destroy, who helped me oh, set yeah. this interview. There you go. So, so massive cheers uh, to the Connecticut boys. Uh, cheers. I really appreciate Connecticut it. Connecticut in the Wayne. house. Thank you so, so much, Wayne. Cheers. Hey, thank you.
Thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. I had such a great time connecting with Wayne. We have played some gigs together uh, across the globe, actually, and uh, it was great to finally catch up with him and to actually have a conversation because sometimes even when you're playing with someone, you don't have a chance to actually sit down and have a conversation with them. I will most likely be doing that the next time Wayne is anywhere near me because I had a great time connecting with him. Definitely head on out there and get your hands on the Breed Brew, uh, which is made by Witch Doctor Brewing Company. I actually managed to get my hands on one, and it was delicious. If you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should absolutely sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that has happened throughout the past week in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal podcast, including all the details for any episodes which I dropped throughout that week, if I've been a guest on someone else's podcast, any information about any cool projects I have going on, such as Brutal North America, as well as the links to the Thirsty Thursday virtual hangs, and the updated links to the Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is available on both Apple Music and Spotify, and is curated by my man, Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself. So please do me a favor and sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list because there's just so much going on in the world of Vox and Hops right now. I would hate for you to miss a single thing. Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media. I have two more episodes coming at you this week, one on Thursday and another on Friday. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops hits. Oh,